We are back with another edition of Yes, We're Here, because yes, we are still here. All of our Yes Network family members trying to connect and bring some content during these difficult times. And right now we get to hang with Buck Showalter and relive some of the more positive aspects of 1995, Buck. You know, we know there's, there's, there's an eventual end to 95 that isn't going to bring a smile, but... 95 feels relevant right now to the sports world because you guys dealt with a shortened season and, and, you know, knowing you are the preparation nut that you are, I'm just wondering, Buck, you know, what was your focus as you were getting your guys ready for the start of the regular season, knowing that it was a truncated beginning to the year compared to what you guys were used to? Ryan, it was uh, really surreal. It was uh, uncharted territory. Everybody was kind of making their way as they went. Uh, it started back in 94. You know, we all remember where we were and certain things happened in our in our history, our country, our, our life. And I can remember hearing Bud Selig saying that they were going to cancel the season. I can remember sitting in my living room going, they're really going to do this. And we went to camp with the replacement players, which was awful, probably the low point in my career. We actually opened up Coors Field. Uh, with replacement players exhibition game seventh inning we got word in the dugout that the strike had been subtle we had to head back to fort lauderdale the coaches were ecstatic they were all it was just awful and uh when the ball went between our second baseman's legs to lose the game we were already out of our uniforms halfway up the, the uh, runway to get out we were so excited about getting back with the players and getting back to spring training and one of the things that we really and i would caution anybody that's asked aaron's asked me a couple times is, is you really going to have to go slow you can't pick up where you left off when you go to camp. But, you know, we fought a defending champion mentality that whole year. And, and, and unless you've been in a locker room, and there's that, you know, wait a minute, we won last year. We felt like we had the best record in American League. We felt like we were on our way to a special season. And we kind of came into that. It took us a long time to find our step. We had to have one of those August, September, I think September in Yankee history in order to get into playoffs. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about some tough memories, but I think the best memory I, I take from that is how many people have come up to me through the years and said that rekindled their love of the game again and got them reinterested in the game instead of the strikes and people not and walkouts and lockouts and whatever you have. That, if we had to take that one on the chin to get our game back on its feet, then so be it. But we did lose to a team with uh, three Hall of Famers. That was a pretty good baseball team they had. Yeah, not not too shabby at all. I, you know, because we go there, Buck, and 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 to that series with Seattle, I I, I want to focus on something that David Cohn always talks about. He always says that when Mattingly ran out for you know his warm ups in Game One of the DS, it is the loudest he has ever heard Yankee Stadium. What do you remember about? the atmosphere, and specifically how it pertained to Don Mattingly finally experiencing playoff baseball? Well, the only competition for David's statement there, and I agree with him, was when he hit the home run in the playoff. It was like, you know, you actually, if people think I'm kidding, you had to do all your communication up the runway. You know, wow. this, I'll tell you, that's the loudest they've ever heard a ballpark or a stadium. You could not even talk to the guy sitting next to you without him going, what'd you say? You actually had to go up the runway to talk to a pitching coach or a player. Wow. And it was the only time I thought a dugout was going to crumble. It was shaking. That old <laughs> thing. And I'm telling you, it was like so – I actually stayed in front of it for a while after Donnie home run. I thought the thing was going to cave in. Don't tell him right now. Wow. Now, very quietly, that season was about Don Mattingly. And I think everybody cared so much. He cared so much about the weight his words carried. And, you know, he didn't go around uh, using that bat to say callous things. He was very – constructive. He had a lot to do with a lot of people's careers. You talk to Paul O'Neill, you talk to even David Cohn, you talk to, they all would have been good players, but just to be accepted and to be respected by Don Mattingly was very important to those guys. And, you know, there was a lot of battles we had because Donnie statistically wasn't doing that well, but, you know, we knew what he meant to our club and, and, the, and the backbone of it. And, uh, we always wanted to treat him with respect. He had told me two weeks before that, hey, I'm going to have to get it going. I may blow my back out one day, but we're not going to get to where we want to go unless I can do the thing the first baseman for the New York Yankees needs to do. And uh, to this day, he did so much for that 
organization by telling us on the plane coming back from Seattle that he wasn't going to play anymore so we could get ahead of everything and trade for Tino Martinez. Mm. The, Buck, when you think about his level of leadership, you know, not just in 95, but throughout his run with the Yankees, and obviously you had him for, for longer than just 95, but what, was the, what were the, maybe the traits that stood out most to you about Donnie as a leader that maybe even were particularly unique to Don Mattingly? Well, Donnie, Donnie uh, he carried what his teammates thought in the presentation, but there got to be a point. It wasn't look how – Look what I can say because I'm I'm the leader. Donnie took it very seriously. He just uh, he didn't ask you to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself, and he didn't take himself too seriously. You could kid with him. He had great work habits. Uh, he just and he but he didn't do it to to be showy about it. His substance yeah. was his style. You know when you think about I mean how many times does someone go hey you reminds me of Mattingly it's hard because people are trying to always do something that shows they've got style instead of their substance being their style. You know, I had a guy named J.J. Hardy was one of the few guys that really remind me of Donnie. Mm, interesting. Buck, I want to, while we're on 95, I want to take us back to spring training and, uh, and, and maybe even just early in the season, we'll extend it to that. When you're getting kind of like your look at where Mariano's at in his development at that point, and obviously he ends up, playing a huge role for you guys at the end of the season. Um, and then, you know, where Andy Pettit ends up being, and, you know, he ends up being a fixture in your rotation throughout 95 as a rookie. You know, what, what was kind of your vision for, and I know Andy had a, a, you know, a much more, you know, lengthy impact on the team that year, but what was your vision for where those guys might factor into the 95 Yankees when you were first seeing them, you know, in spring and in the early parts of the season? Well, you know, we, we knew who we were and who we weren't. It's very important for organization. We had great leadership in front office with Gene Michael. But, you know, there's a process with young players. You can't skip to, from A to Z. You know, where Andy was in the process, where Mariano was in the process. I mean, we took a lot of grief and really banged it around whether we should even take him on a postseason roster. And he played a big part in it. I don't think he was ready to be Mariano. If you remember, he had a process where, with Wetland where he worked through that. To get there, you know, he hadn't really discovered the cutter yet. He was mostly late past fastball, and he gave up some some hits in that series, a big home run, but can't, got right back on the horse. But there was there's a process with young players, and what they're going to become isn't always what they were at that stage. And understanding that, and uh, trying to create, we felt so good about bringing young players into that environment because of someone like Maddie. We knew they were going to get a great vision of what it was supposed to be like to be a a New York Yankee and a major league player. That's one of the things, the reason why we took Jeter on the travel roster, just to watch, because we wanted him to be around that environment. It didn't take Johnny Super Scout to figure out Derek was going to be a pretty good player, okay? I mean, you know, that's why he was picked in the first, what, two or three picks in the country. I mean, let's, right. let's slow down. Don't call ourselves how smart we were taking Derek Jeter in the first round. <laughs> how about, Buck, um, with Pettit? You know, we've talked about him a lot in, you know, recent years, obviously, about how he became a, a leader of the staff. And, you know, one of the relationships we always talk about is him with CeCe. And then CeCe talked about how, you know, once Andy was gone, he wanted to take on that role. And I know one of the guys he brought under his wing was Jordan Montgomery. But if we go back to the beginning of Andy's career, he always would talk about his relationship with Jimmy Key and, and the way that, you know, he emulated Jimmy Key. What was the dynamic like between those two lefties? That's a great point. A lot of people forget that, uh, Ryan. He, uh, there was a torch back then. It was important to pass a good torch down, you know, and, you know, guys took that responsibility. Some of the guys don't want that responsibility of leadership. You know, they want, I call them headphone guys. They, they want to put their headphones <laughs> on, they go back to the room, shut the door, put the do not disturb, and mm -hmm. throw away reality. You know, these guys were okay with the reality. And, Jimmy, I remember Jimmy talking to, to Andy about it, and David Cohn would talk to it about it. So your job is to give your team a chance to win the game. Mm. It doesn't mean that, you know, when you're not carrying good stuff, which is going to happen about maybe 10 starts out of 30-plus, where you've got everything at your disposal, what are you going to do to keep your team in the game? That's really what separates you. So when it's, you know, early in the game and it's getting ready to get away from you, if you can keep that in touch, then all of a sudden everybody wants to talk about the eighth and ninth inning 
but it's what Andy Pettit or Jimmy Key did. Because Jimmy didn't have great stuff then. He was pitching with guile. He right. was pitching with the repertoire. He was – he's the first guy that had a uh, – we call it a slide step change up, a jump where he would jump at you quickly and speed your, your body up and then throw a change up. First guy I ever saw throw, then everybody started copying it. Had a great move to first, held runners, uh, knew who to pitch around. I mean, I could sit there and go get – you know, a cup of coffee with two guys I knew he wasn't going to pitch to. You know, he would get to the, but he knew how to manage a batting order. Yeah. He knew what went into it, and he passed that along. A lot of guys aren't free with that. Jimmy was free sharing that information. So was Andy. You're so confident in your own uh, personality and who you are that you don't mind sharing it with somebody else. But they don't share it with just anybody. They pick the right guy who can take it to another level. CeCe was that guy. Andy was that guy for Jimmy Keith. And um, it worked out well for everybody. No, it definitely did. And, and all of our eyes uh, who watch Yankee baseball benefited because of it. Buck, I told you, know, when I said 95, you didn't know where we were going to go. But we stayed mostly on the good parts of 95, right? Well, I, I try to look at it all positively. But I just hope and pray no Yankee fan ever has to get on a plane from Seattle back to New York after game five. That was awful. It was oh. awful. I mean, it, Bucky, we always hear about, like, I mean, David says all the time, Coney, like, it is it is the, you know, it's the quietest, most, like, gut-wrenching plane ride he's ever experienced. I, it, it, I mean, it really was just tears and silence. Well, you know, Donnie at that time, I spent a lot of time, Donnie came up and sat down, so I need to talk to you about something. It was about his pending retirement. And, uh, you know, he had two boys or three boys at home that needed him there for a lot of reasons. Uh, his back was as he told me, was not going to let him do the things that a first baseman needs to do the Yankees. I want to give you guys a heads up so you can go out and get somebody before the whole world knows it. Uh, it was a lot of walking around, just, you know, we all shared the same emotion. And uh, uh, the only thing we really had to show for it, which I've still got upstairs, is a hat. It's got these uh, ace and a jack and wild card winner. That was the first year we ever had it. And, you know, the great September we had to get there. Um, I know coming off the field in Toronto when we had clinched getting in and uh, just look, the look on Donnie's face. Back then, you know, it's, ju it's just a glance. It's, it's catching eyes with somebody. You know, they know. You don't have to sit there and let the whole world know that you're happy. You know, it's just, it's just that certain camaraderie you have through going through that together. And it was, it was tough. You know, the coaches and managers weren't no part of being in spring training with a replacement player, but you had no choice. Well, Buck – it's always great hearing your stories and your perspective, man. Thank you so much for doing this and uh, stay safe and stay well. And, and, you know, to our audience, yes, we're here. Yes. God bless you. I appreciate you. Thanks, Ryan. You got it, Buck.